oligopoly, monopolistic competition and monopoly are market structures that we'll look at in future programs, but here we're going to focus on perfect competition. We've got to look at this twice. We've got to look at how price and output is determined in the short run. And then we'll have to look at how price and output is determined in the long run. The terms short run and long run have very precise meanings in economics. The short run is the period of time in which the volume of capital is fixed. So the producer, say a hotel, can still increase its output, but it does it by working the existing capital, the hotel, harder, fitting more people into the dining room and so on. The long run is the period of time in which not only can it increase the amount of labour, but it can increase the amount of capital as well. So if demand is high enough, the hotel might expand by building more rooms and so on. So in the short run, its capacity is fixed. In the long run, its capacity is variable. Just like the hotel has a fixed number of rooms or dining space, the farmer has a fixed amount of land. So what's the size of the farm in terms of the number of animals we're talking about? We're down on the sheep numbers this year. We were running 800 last year. We're down to 600 this year. Uh, mostly through lack of uh, profit from the ewes. Um, the dairy cows, we milk about 300 dairy animals. Our main business is uh, dairy production. We are price takers, basically. Um, we're completely in the hands of uh, the supermarkets at the moment. And the price we're getting paid has got no relationship at all to the profitability of the end use of the milk. So if farmers are not making a profit milking cows, will they stay in the industry? In the short run, they have no choice. But in the long run, some will leave the industry. A lot of farmers are getting out of milk and we've seen a mass exodus of dairy producers. Uh, more commercially minded farms, shall we say, milking a lot more cows. They have tended to get out of production through lack of income as well. Being big doesn't no, equate to making lots of money? No, it doesn't. No, um, it does. At the moment, it almost equates to losing a lot of money. <laughs> because obviously, if you're milking 300 cows and you're losing 100 pounds a head, you're probably better off milking 20 cows and only losing 20 pounds a head. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, there's got to be enough profitability in the industry to keep people willing to work. Without, without some income, uh, people are not going to carry on producing. Um, uh, that is true. Prices farmers get for their products have varied greatly in recent years as supply and demand conditions have altered. This farmer has remained in the industry, even though he's operating at a short-run loss. However, in the long run, this farmer will need to cover costs in order to stay in the industry. Now what are the costs of the firm in the short run? We've already looked at that, we've made the distinction between fixed and variable costs, added them up to get total costs in the short run, and then we derived a marginal and an average cost from our total costs. And you remember that the shapes of these curves are determined by the law of diminishing returns. Now what about the revenue that the firm receives as it increases its output? Well this is a perfectly competitive industry and there are large numbers of suppliers in the market. So the price is determined by supply and demand. The firm has to accept the price which is given in the marketplace. So here we have some farmer and the price which is determined in the market for his carrots or whatever is the commodity is one pound per kilo or whatever is the quantity. What's his choice with regard to price? He has to be willing to sell his product at a pound a kilo. If he tries selling for more than a pound he'll fail because other farmers are producing exactly the same product and selling it at a pound a unit. 
Is there any point in trying to capture a bigger market share by charging less than a pound a unit? None at all. He can sell all that he wishes to sell at the ruling price of a pound. So he has no control over price. He is what we sometimes call a price taker, where the price is taken from the market, which is determined by the interaction of supply and demand. So what's his relationship between the output he produces and the price he can charge? Well, you can see from the table that as he sells more units of output and increases output, nothing happens to the price. In a large market where there is a big supplier, if the big supplier increases output, it may change the price. But if you are just a tiny farmer in a huge market, the significance to the market of you increasing your price is nil. You can sell all that you want at a pound a unit. So what's the relationship between output and total revenue? If you make nothing, you get no revenue. If you make one unit, the price is a pound, your total revenue is one pound. Where do we get that from? Total revenue is simply the number of units of output multiplied by the price. So two units of output and a pound a unit gives us a total revenue of two pounds, and so on. Now we might like to know what is average revenue? Revenue per unit of output. Well, if, for example, he's selling seven units of output at a total revenue of seven pounds, how much is he getting per unit? We divide the total revenue, seven, by the number of units of output, seven, and we get one pound. On average, the price he's getting is the same as his average revenue. So at any market, price and average revenue are the same thing. One more critical relationship is his marginal revenue. That is to say, how much extra revenue will he generate if he increases his output by one unit? Well, if he's making nothing and he increases output to one unit, the extra revenue he generates is a pound. Revenue rises from zero to one. If he's already making one unit and he increases his output to two units per day, per week, whatever is the time period, total revenue rises to two pounds. That is to say, he generates an extra pounds worth of revenue. So marginal revenue is the same as the price. So we've now established the relationship between his output and his revenue, between output and price. So if he knows the revenue conditions and he knows the cost conditions, he'll be able to work out what's the best level of output to produce. Bear in mind that he's going to just accept the ruling price. Well, here's the diagram that shows you the relationship between output and total revenue. At zero output, there's zero revenue. The total revenue curve raises as a straight line from the origin. So that's our total revenue curve. Now we can put the total cost curve for the short run on top of the same diagram. So we've got the farmer's total revenue at different levels of output, total costs at different levels of output. What level of output is he going to make? Well, you can see that he reaches a point where total cost is equal to total revenue. If he picks that level of output that we've called on the diagram Q1, he makes no profit but no loss. Total revenue equals total costs. If he makes Q2 output, again, no profit, no loss, total revenue equals total cost. So any level of output between Q1 and Q2 gives him some profit because total revenue exceeds total cost. But he doesn't just want to make some profit, he wants to maximise profit. So he'll pick the level of output where the gap between total revenue and total cost 
is maximised, which on our diagram is at QE, so that the gap between STC and TR represents the total profit per period that the farmer will make. Now we can show the same thing on the next pair of diagrams. This isn't a different idea, it's the same diagram in a different form. Here we have the market, the industry, with our supply and demand curve establishing the price, the equilibrium price PE, which we've assumed to be a pound. And we've seen that that is the price which the farmer makes whichever level of output he chooses to produce. So here's our farmer to the right of the supply and demand curve, the firm, with this horizontal demand curve for the individual producer, showing that he can sell as many units as he likes at the price of a pound. And we've seen also that the average revenue is the same as the marginal revenue, so that establishes our farmer's demand curve. Notice that the industry demand curve is downward sloping, but the demand curve for any one producer is horizontal. It's perfectly elastic. Now let's impose our costs on the same diagram, our marginal and average cost curve, with a marginal cost cutting average cost at its minimum point and ask the question, what's the profit maximizing level of output? Well, the way to think about it is this. Whatever level of output I'm making now, is it worth making one more unit? And the answer is, if it adds more to revenue than it adds to costs, it's got to be worth doing. So I will always expand my output if the extra cost, marginal cost, is less than the extra revenue it generates, marginal revenue. So I'll keep on expanding output until the extra cost, marginal cost, is as great as the extra revenue, marginal revenue. So I'll produce QE output where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. That must be the profit maximizing level of output. If I make any more units of output, addition to cost becomes greater than addition to revenue, I would be making a loss on those additional units. So QE is the profit maximizing level of output. How much profit is the firm making? Well, we can work that out too from the diagram. Having chosen QE as our level of output, we can work out the total revenue. We've got QE output, and we multiply that by the revenue per unit, average revenue. So let's assume that QE is, say, 10 units of output. Then if we multiply 10 by a pound, the rectangle gives us 10 pounds worth of revenue per day, per week, whatever is the time period. But that's not profit, because we still have to subtract costs from that. What are our costs of producing these assumed 10 units of output? Well, we can work that out, because we know that at 10 units of output, average cost is 80 pence per unit. That's average cost, read off the average cost curve. So 10 lots of 80p is the eight pounds worth of total costs. So the difference between total cost and total revenue, the shaded area represents the profit per period of time. And I hope you can see that that level of output which maximizes profit QE is the same level of output that we had on our first diagram where we looked at the totals. 
If you go back to that diagram for a minute, the slope of the short run total cost curve, which we called marginal cost, has the same slope at the profit maximizing level of output as the slope of the total revenue curve. Well, the slope of the total revenue curve is marginal revenue. Marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So we could confirm on that diagram the answer that we've just got from our average and marginal diagram.